Hi everyone, this is Saya. This is Master Pasta. And this is Laika. And you're listening to Stars in My Pocket. This episode, we're discussing School 2017, the latest installment in the school franchise. It's a story of students who struggle to find their place in a system where everything seems set against them. Our heroine Uno is a terrible student who dreams of making it big with her drawing talents, while the hero, Taeun, is imprisoned by his own privilege. Meanwhile, mysterious student X carries out acts of vigilante justice against the high school's corrupt officials, bringing our leads and their friends together in life-changing ways. So what did you guys think about this show generally, overall? Did I go first? Sure. Professor Fester, do you want to go first? All right. Uh, I liked it. The last time I watched anything from this franchise was uh, School 2013. And uh, I think I had higher expectations from the school part of the story. But it turns out that it was a romance that got me to stick with the drama, not exactly the the high school uh, corruption, the, well, you know, the various school related stuff. So, yeah, no, I wasn't disappointed. I, I was pretty happy with the uh, overall show, but I think my expectations were a bit too high. Mm. Saya, what did you think? Uh, I have to start by saying I haven't finished it. Um, so I've gotten nearly to the end of episode 13, and part of it is that I like it so much I don't want to finish it, and the other part of it is that there's no time. But also, I think it's worth mentioning that I very nearly dropped this show, because I watched the first episode and I was so excited, because, like uh, like Fester Faster said, School 2013 was just, you know, great. And then we had School 2015, which I watched, and it was nearly great, except then it wasn't. So when this started and episode one came along, I wasn't sure if this was going to be good or if it wasn't going to be good, but it was so, 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 so boring by the second half that I very nearly dropped it. But actually it was like it was your recommendation that made me pick it back up again. And I'm very glad I did. Nice. How about you? I also didn't watch, like, Fast Faster. I didn't watch 2015, um, but I loved 2013. I made my mom and my sister watch it too, and they loved it too. And it... I agree that the school part wasn't as strong, but the but the romance and also the friendships between the kids just completely captured my heart. Like they were the best part of the whole thing, and I really enjoyed that part. Even though it did start out kind of slow in the beginning, it was very there were a lot of plot threads. It was kind of confused, and I didn't really know where anything was going. But by like episode three, I was completely hooked. So yeah, and I I finished it, and I. I liked the ending a lot, so I really, I really liked the themes and the message of the show. So yeah, loved it. You didn't find the ending slightly anticlimactic. Don't say that. I, I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> hey, I didn't spoil anything, and you don't know what I'm talking about. You said anticlimactic. You've ruined it for me forever. <laughs> oh come on! Clearly, like I don't think it was anticlimactic. I actually. <laughs> I actually liked the ending a lot, but I found episode 15 completely useless because it, it just yeah, I, dragged it out <laughs> like one conflict for the whole episode. But like, I really liked the way they ended it. I'm sitting here in the corner crying. I shouldn't have been. Okay, hey, we're not going to spoil anything for you, but it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, uh, I'm pretty what? sure I'm the one who spent six weeks trying to convince you to watch it. <laughs> and then you fell behind. It's not my fault. There's not enough time. Uh, yeah. Why okay, so you're not spoiled you? because we have different opinions about the ending, so you're fine. Yes. Just make your own decision. We didn't tell you what happened, so you're you'll be okay. I will ignore I will ignore both of yours and make up my own mind. Well, <laughs> this is yeah. what you should do. Um, I completely agree with Raika about uh, episode 15, though it was out of filler. The only thing that I liked was um, how they started off. Uh, okay, there's going to be a mild spoiler, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to do a major thing. But did you finish episode 13? I would have with another 10 minutes. Ah, uh, okay. But you guys made me come and talk to you. Yeah, okay, no, the, the only thing that I really liked about episode 15 was uh, that it, it kind of, you know, usually it's all about the guy protecting the girl in, I don't know, these kind of high school romances where the girl is generally more naive than the guy. But in this one, I liked how the girl was aware of the situation, even while the boy was, you know, trying to figure out the stuff quietly by himself. So it was about both of them yeah. protecting each other and not just him protecting her. So that was pretty cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. I in general, I really liked how much communication there was between all yeah. of our characters for the most part. That was really nice. I'm glad you mentioned the uh, gender role thing because it's actually something I noticed a lot between Uno and Teun is that there were it wasn't like that noticeable, but they had these little subtle things where Uno was often kind of making, you know, doing the boy stuff and Teun would do the girl stuff. Like she makes him read comics and he gets all giddy about, uh, you know, when, when she... Uh, admits that she likes him back and he's all like you know this is our day one and that's kind of you would associate that more with a girl thing and it's so cute it's adorable and yeah he's, so he's unembarrassed like as well. <laughs> yeah and he's like yeah like you said giddy and like flailing when she does something <laughs> she's just like whatever <laughs> he's like oh my god she looked at me she smiled at me she's so pretty oh my god it's and, adorable oh my gosh and how like she doesn't lose her head even though she really likes him she doesn't like become besotted with him like when he calls her out for chicken in the middle of the night and you know oh she's like oh do you want to die <laughs> and he's like just one chicken that. just one chicken and then she mimics <laughs> back to him just one chicken <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so great all the kids here do threaten each other with death quite often right i think it's just a figure of speech isn't it yeah i feel like it's a figure of speech that is a lot less extreme sounding in Korean than it is in English. Whereas in English, you wouldn't really say that to somebody, but... It's it's not so much about it sounding extreme. It's just that they um, use it in dramatic moments a lot. Like, they will uh, threaten Hee-chan with uh, deaths and practically every other time they faced off. Or even Devi, for that matter. It just, it's... They overuse that. Isn't that a boy uh, thing? Is it really a boy thing? I've never heard it being used that often. Oh, that's funny because yeah. I didn't. It didn't stand out. I'm to really me. going to die. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I feel like it's. I feel like it's kind die. of a teenager thing, though, because teenagers are so over the top and extreme with their emotions in general. Like everything is such a huge trauma for them. Whereas by the time you get to like your twenties, then you're just like, okay, life is not. It's not like an emergency all the time. You can kind of let things take their course. But when you're 18, everything's like, oh my god, I'm gonna die, or like this is the best thing of my <laughs> life, or. I'm going to love this person until I'm 108. You know, like, it's just really intense. I also do think it's... And I feel like they really captured that well in this show. (laughs) I also do think it is a bit of a language thing. Like, for example, I was just thinking, do we have an English equivalent? Um, Perhaps not English equivalent, but like a, a, a local equivalent in, like, London, which is something that kids would say in the playground is like, you know, I'm going to bust you up. As in, I'm going to bust you up. So I'm going to bust you up. And they'll say that with any, like, any provocation. You want me to bust you up? Shall I do that? <laughs> like, it's a thing that people just say without it actually yeah. meaning, I am actually going to bust you up. So. Yeah. I feel like that's the I think whole it's both. It's partially the age. Yeah, and it's partially just a language thing. Because here, I feel like, um, like in the US English, people do still say, I'm going to kill you, but it has to be for, like, pretty serious things. Like, it, you're still not actually going to kill them, but it's just reserved for more serious things, whereas I feel like in Korean it's used more casually sometimes. These are really good points, but the thing that, uh, the reason this kind of bothered me was because they, uh, the story uh, kind of positioned these characters in these very heavily dramatic moments. Like, the drama didn't actually, like, for them, the stakes were really high. And so the curses weren't just flippant, you know, they actually had like proper anger and uh, like real violence behind them. So when you say something like that, but you don't have the uh, ability to carry them out, uh, it just, it, what I'm trying to say is that I never at any point felt like the curses had enough heat behind them, even though they were used to uh, portray uh a more serious situation, like for instance, mm. <laughs> between Devi and Teun, when they were having their friendly ship, as things were escalating, they were swearing more and more at each other. And even though uh, the drama behind their, okay, actually I didn't actually, I wasn't too invested in their history, and their bromance didn't make much sense to me, because it didn't have enough feeling behind it uh, to actually explain all of that swearing. It, it felt like they were overcompensating with the swearing because there was an actual heat behind their anger. Oh, I didn't feel that way. I thought that, uh, one, 
uh, the limitations of you know um, public TV is you can't swear, um, but also I think it's a youth thing that the words are the best that you've got when you can't use your fists, so you summon up all of your energy into throwing those curses out. And I, it, I, I did feel animosity in it, and you're, you're saying that you didn't feel the animosity. Especially when you compare it with School 2013. Okay, that's a, I, I think School 2013 is a totally different level. Like, it's a... It's, However, it's just something what, different. What this? Wasn't this romance a paler version of what they had between Gonam Soon and uh, Park Soo? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I I agree that the um, the romance does not in any way compare with the school 2013 romance, which was like epic on so many levels, and you understood like everything about that relationship and why it broke up and why they were so heartbroken, and I cried so much for them. <laughs> but I feel like the main relationship in school 2017 is actually the one between Taeun and Unho, whereas mm-hmm. in 2013 it was between the two guys, you know? So They tried too hard to push the romance forward and it just wasn't working, so finally they just gave up and, you know, went into what actually worked, which was Raab, you know, and Kim Taewoon's relationship, which was amazing. It was perfect. It was a glittery and sparky and awesome first love. It's my favorite high school thing since since uh, Reply 1997. That was, that was golden, and this is right after that. I kind of feel what you're saying, Fester Fester, about it not really not really feeling it, but I feel like part of the reason is also because they spent too long fighting with each other and hating each other, and it was so intense and vicious that by the time they reconciled, we didn't have enough of, like, I don't know, like, the, we didn't get to see what actually they loved about each other and what worked in their friendship because all we saw were like a few flashbacks of them being with their friend who died like it, it wasn't there wasn't enough of that to give the reconciliation like enough weight even though i liked it it worked for me but i know what you mean like it could have been done better yeah um i actually found their reconciliation less can conv- not not less convincing but they uh Let's go with less, less convincing. So their reconcili- their fight and their animosity was more believable to me than the period after they had reconciled. Like their friendliness, their friendness to each other wasn't, uh, like it didn't have quite that same quality of warmth and friendship. But also, I think that that perhaps is a natural result of I think their friendship couldn't go back to the way it used to be because too much had changed between them. Um, mm. And because Taeyeon was, uh, you know, putting his emotional energy into his relationship with Uno, and because, you know, Taewoo was being, like, he was focused on getting, you know, uh, his grades and all of that. So although they had reconciled, their friendship, nece- like, necessarily didn't return to the old friendship it just became something new because there's still a lot of pain between them like i think you can feel that but they kind of accept each other now yeah i think you're giving them way too much credit i don't think they put that level of thought into this maybe i am but also i perhaps i think i have an investment in jang dong yoon because i watched solomon's perjury which i don't know if either of you watched oh but no i didn't watch that and uh, I, I love that show so much. Um, and Chang Dong Yoon plays a really great character in that show. So I like have this affection. Like whenever he comes on screen, I'm paying more attention to him. Uh, like he's more on my radar than you know some of the other characters. And for example, also in Solomon's Perjury, we had uh, what was his name? Uh, so So Ji Hoon. So Ji Hoon, who was again a really adorable character in Solomon's Perjury, and he's practically nobody in this show. He's the guitar guy, the one who makes friends with Sarang. But I, that's why I'm watching him. I'm watching him, and he's on screen. I'm expecting him to have something more. Like you know, in the beginning, I thought he was X, because you know, you you're not gonna just cast him to look yeah. pretty, right? He can act. He can do stuff. So. When it turned out that he kind of was just there to look pretty, I was a bit sad. It's like, oh, So Ji Hoon, play a bigger role. I think initially, uh, I think initially he was going to play that as a red herring because he was so prominent. I did think he was excellent. You remember when uh, uh, Yin Ho runs up to the uh, roof and he just emerges from behind the chairs? Mm, yeah. 
that, that was definitely uh, a red herring. They, they were trying to sort of like be like, ha, so, you know, possible that it's him. And then, of course, you know, X comes out of that uh, hidden room in the back. So, yeah. But about yeah. uh, Song Dehe, um, I have to say, when I was in Soul on the Romance, I loved his character. Like, his arc as this guy who's desperately trying to make it into the university um, of his choice and he doesn't have parental support or any of the privileges that uh, rich kids like uh, Kim Hee Chan have. I loved his arc. I loved his, you know, him regaining his self-respect. I, I thought Song Dae Hee uh, was one of the only characters in the show who had a complete arc that way. Everybody else pretty much remained the same. You know, they began as a good person, ended as a good person, or, you know, aside from one uh, particular character, of, like, uh, among the adults, everybody else pretty much stayed the same, whereas Song Dae Hee had a proper character arc. He, he properly matured. I really like that. Yeah, I agree. His arc was amazing. And he did such a great job of showing all the various emotions. Like, my heart broke so much for him when he was, you know, having to endure all those humiliations, you know, in front of those rich parents and because of He-Chan and stuff. And it was really nice to see him come into his own. That was wonderful. I was actually really surprised uh, when we first find out that he's not a rich kid because because of the way he was, I assumed he was one of them. So... You know, when they revealed his actual origins, I was like, oh. No, but that's what made him so impressive, right? That he mm. uh, made it to the top without any of the help that all of the other rich kids were getting. Like, Kim Hee Chan could not have been second in class without his help. Mm. All the other rich kids were getting uh, tuitions. And the, I really like that one moment when, uh, so, uh, you know who was leaving one of the academies because she could no longer afford uh, the things? She was leaving because she couldn't afford it and here were these two girls who were walking in complaining about their parents forcing them to attend the academy. I thought that, yeah. was, mm. that was really, yeah, that, that was really... That's quite a powerful yeah. contrast. Yeah, I think the show does a really good job of just showing how, like, how the system is stacked against somebody who doesn't have the money to be able to attend all these, you know, private tutoring and to have the money to have parents who will put all this extra you know, investment into your education that you need to make your resume look good for college. And like, it just showed how it's kind of hope, like in the beginning, especially for, oh no, it's kind of a hopeless, you know, if she, and even for somebody who has a lot of grades like Dewey, like, because he doesn't have those specs, um, it's, I don't know how realistic of a portrayal that is, but it seems to be similar to what students have to go through. And that was really heartbreaking to see. And you could really feel their desperation and why they would go to so such lengths, you know, to pursue their dreams. The thing I wanted to say was that that's a direct contrast with uh, Hichun, who, who, like, there was that part when he was in the car with his mum, and she was just, you know, mm. pressurising him more and more, and he explodes, you know, he doesn't even explode, because kids like him don't explode. He just says, he you know, did he? Or maybe he yeah, did, he I don't remember. Like he shut down completely, right? He finally became what his mom wanted, but not yeah, really. Yeah, the logical... Yeah. Although, maybe yeah, you're talking yeah. about a point that I haven't got to yet. The logical result of that kind of parenting. <laughs> maybe, exactly. maybe you're... Like the beginning of a sociopath <laughs> yeah. life. Oh, that's right. true. No, no, we're but talking like, about the same moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking, we're talking like, about the same moment. The point where he says, you know, let me breathe. And, like, you know, he's suffocating under the weight of that, whereas you know, mm. the others have this quite free relationship where they're actually able to breathe in their relationships with their parents. But he has, I mean, it's a complete opposite for Hichun that he doesn't have that breathing space at all. And yeah, he, you know, and that point, actually, you're right, uh, like a, that point where his mum looks at him and is like, you know, what monster have I created? <laughs> so. It kind of reminds me a little bit, because I watched Sassy Go Go like three weeks ago, it really reminds me of like Chae Soo Bin's character. Yeah. Um, Although she gets a redemption arc, mm. um, yeah. so it her but like the way that her mom parented her throughout the sh you can see like the end result of the way she's raised her and how like she yeah, basically like, she, like yeah. nearly breaks down. Whereas Hee Chan doesn't have that like same kind of breakdown, but you can see that his his mom basically made him that way. Mm. Like Although she doesn't seem repentant, but... they're products. Right, they're not even people. Absolutely. They're products of their parents' manufacture, which is 
quite frightening. So what do you guys think about the teachers? Before we mention the, the main teachers, can we mention the hilariously subversive PE teacher? <laughs> <laughs> Every time he opened his mouth, I cracked up. And he's, of course, the, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's in everything. And he's always... I love that actor. <laughs> yeah. 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 He has a dry way of delivering lines. It, it's... Yeah. He's the best. Yeah, I first noticed him in Pinocchio. He was probably my favorite thing about that show. Yeah, he, yeah. he was also in Surf. Oh, I remember... Was, I think. Yeah, and also beautiful mind. He, he really stood out in that one. <laughs> he, he has this way of taking some quite sort of spiky characters and he makes them quite endearing. And sometimes, you know, the side characters are the ones that make the show just that much better to watch. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. he's one of them. Absolutely. And the other guy, oh gosh, uh, the vice principal guy, again, who is in everything, who also always plays these really extreme characters. <laughs> like, <laughs> Park Chung Min, yeah. <laughs> you write him. Yeah, he he's really funny. funny too. Yeah, and I liked how straight faced he was, which was a direct contrast to the principal's <laughs> overflow in character. It was, it was good. I mean, their, their dynamic was pretty good. So there's a bro- romance that I could root for. <laughs> Yeah, Would and also, like, I just loved how the vice principal was always, yeah, he was always, like, subtly throwing shade on the principal, and, like, half the time it would just go over the principal's head, and other times he would get really offended, but he wouldn't be able to do anything. That was, that was funny. <laughs> well, you got the feeling that he couldn't quite pinpoint what just happened, but he was, like, pretty sure something, like, insulting just happened to me, but I'm not actually smart enough to figure out exactly what it was, but something's wrong. <laughs> So, like, again, I'm bringing in school 2013 because that's my school reference point. And also because it just, they, they left, um, or at least they drew in so many similarities uh, with the type of characters they cast. Like, uh, the teacher, uh, Teacher Shim, uh, was obviously uh, Jang Nara's character, right? It that's was, so true. She, right, and, and yeah. uh, Daniel Choi's character was probably supposed to be uh, the uh, police lady, I don't know what police, some, some officer, I don't, I don't actually know who she was in this Suji Sim, thing. she like, was, what? yeah, Sonho. Yeah, I'll talk about so, her somehow, somehow she was employed by a school, but she was a police officer, I'm not entirely sure what, what her job was. I think she was sent to the school to, yeah, she was sent to the school to catch X, basically, and it was, um, Taewon's dad, who basically hired her because he was friends with the police chief, I think, who was her boss. So I don't know who was paying her salary, but... That, that's was... what I initially thought, but the way they were talking about her assignment, it kind of sounded like being assigned to schools is something that uh, is not uh, out of the normal. So I... I, And she was being addressed uh, as a teacher by the students. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, was, and then she remained uh, assigned to the school in the end. She was doing PE. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really understand why that was able to happen. Her t- her character didn't make a lot of sense. Like, I liked her backstory and stuff, but it wasn't a strong character, especially if you set yeah. it up as a parallel to Daniel Choi, who was amazing in School 2013. It kind of pales in comparison. Yeah. Wait, she had a back- backstory? What, what, what was it? Oh, she was supposed yeah. to be in school. Yeah, she had, you know, she had the, the common background with the delinquent and she had the redemption arc, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't too memorable. It wasn't, and it was partly that it was written very in very broad strokes and it was partly that, like, that actress doesn't have the charisma to pull off a former delinquent turned police officer. She just looks like an idol, which is what she is. So, like, she was really cute in Radiant Office, but, I mean, she suited that character much better. Yeah, but so. Teacher Shim really, uh, he, he was a bit of a disappointment. Like, I could see initially what they were doing with this character, and he was feeling guilty that he was going along with the establishment. So that part was good, but then they didn't actually do much with this character. And um, I think the parallel to uh, Ong Force was supposed to be Teacher Gu. <laughs> And that did not work. Again, the guy had like no arc, so yeah, yeah. The teachers were a bit disappointed. 
Yeah, they kind of blended together somewhat for me as well. They weren't as powerful as characters as in the school 2013. Sorry, Saya, did you want to say something? Uh, maybe. I've forgotten it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I just thought I heard you like something. <laughs> so I did have something to say a while back, but I've forgotten what it was. Never mind. <laughs> What, what I did want to say about uh, Teacher Goo is that um, I actually found him a little bit confusing to start with because um, he seems a bit like a villainous teacher initially, but then as you go on, he starts being helpful, but it's not quite clear. I mean, it's like there was a just a, for no reason he did like a you know an about face and started being helpful, while before that he was just kind of evil. And he wasn't yeah. helpful though; he was just passive. Like he 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 remained like he started sort of passively saying oh you guys didn't do anything wrong but he wasn't actually actively didn't, helpful. Didn't he early on uh, t- uh like victimize uh, Uno and some of the other students and stuff like in quite a cruel way? So if, you, if you if you if you stop doing something wrong that doesn't mean you're being helpful. No, but then he like you know then he signed that poster you know with his little nine and all of that. Which, so, which nobody figured out. Which, which and nobody also, knew who true, was. but like we knew. But also, you know, he's like not quite passive, but like he he supported them emotionally, if not actively. Um, you know, he supported them standing up against the system. He facilitated um, Teon and Teo's makeup. Uh, you know, by like forcing them together in detention and stuff like that. So, like, you know, he did stuff, but it wasn't quite clear why he did them or what kind of teacher he had been up until then. Whereas with uh, Teacher Shim, you know, yes, he was uh, over-idealistic. I actually really liked him, but I realize I like him the way you like a puppy. Like, he was very adorable, but not necessarily effective. But, you know, his heart was his heart was all in the right place. Well, I mean, with, uh, regarding Teacher Gu, like, I agree with you, Saya, that, like, they didn't really... It seems to me like they were trying to make him a more sympathetic character with him, like, not being so horrible anymore and, like, subtly supporting the students, even though, like, he didn't have to actually stick his neck out or, you know, sacrifice anything. But he was so horrible in the beginning. Like, he basically told him, oh, you're, like, a, a six-tier student. That means you're, like, a person with no value and you'll never amount to anything. Like, that's mm-hmm. not something a teacher should ever say. And just because he made the two guys make up later, like, I didn't forgive him for that. That was not enough. For me, I don't know I, how you guys felt. Yeah, my point exactly. <laughs> but also, I, I think you know. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just one point. Um, I think his character was supposed to be a blend of uh, uh, teacher Yoon, uh, that was Ankos, and uh, uh, the PE teacher from uh, school 2013. You know, the older teacher Joe, I think. Um, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he, he did the same thing with. Um, uh, yeah, those two boys in school 2013, um, uh, Namsoon and uh, He locked them up in the, like he made them do all of those uh, punishments so that they could spend more time together. And oh, uh, wait, he didn't do it. Uh, Philip Choi did, right? Mm. Uh, sorry, Daniel Choi did. Um, okay, what was he doing? Oh, wait, he he was he was he was sort of he he did something similar to uh, Kang Se Chan, and he sort of. You know, encouraged uh, Kang Se Chan to, I don't know, be, become better friends with the students. And in turn, also, then Kang Se Chan went and, yeah, helped these two become friends again. Uh, he was, and, and he also forced, um, he also forced Jang Nara and Daniel Choi to work together, even though they hated each other. Like, he kind of, because yeah. Daniel Choi was his former student and Jang Nara really looked up to him, she kind of, like, pushed them together. Like, he was more of a mentor to the teachers rather than to the students. In, in yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And in turn, that that helped uh, Daniel Choi's character to become a mentor to the students. So, mm. yeah. so kind of to pivot a little bit, if you don't mind, can we talk about the principal as a villain? And do you think that he worked as a villain? Nah. What do you guys? <laughs> no. Yeah. No I feel like he was more there for comic relief in many ways, like or just as a symbol of bureaucracy gone crazy. Yeah. yeah, but his, I mean, he, I, like, after episode, like, by the end, second half of the drama, I was like, why are you not fired? Like, it didn't even logically make sense why he would be... Yeah, why was still, he still there? ...stick around for <laughs> yeah. that long. Even, yeah, like, even if the school is corrupt, he was such an embarrassment, and he was making so many mistakes that I feel like it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was ridiculous. 
uh, though uh, we know by now that uh, Tehun's dad, uh, wait, what was his name? Dad. Okay, he's just Tehun's Sorry? dad. Sorry, his name was dad. dad. <laughs> so we know by now that Tehun's dad uh, is a pretty corrupt individual, right? And the principal obviously was in on it, like the uh, the the outdated, the expired food and all of that. Obviously, both the chairman and the principal know about it. So if you try to fire this guy, he can. I don't know, retaliate by complaining to the education office, for instance. Yeah, I Maybe guess that's, that's true. He was suspended and not fired. I feel that's like true. he's not uh, the principal. Didn't have enough gumption to use what he knew in a way that could uh, actually, you know, make real changes or just to hurt someone like he he's the kind of person who hurts you by his flailing not because he's aimed uh you know aimed a shot at you that's true I, although i just i feel like it was a little bit too much of a caricature and it were it would have worked better if it was less of one just because our student characters were so fully realized and interesting and you know lovable and it would be nice if the villain was a little bit more fleshed out too i know he wasn't the only villain but he was the one that they interacted with the most did you so. guys uh, have you both watched sassy gogo you i think you yeah, have right of course. do you remember yes. the prince do you remember the principal in that how do you think the two principals compare she was she scarier was properly, yeah she, she was scarier and, and she um the stuff that she did actually had an impact on the student's life in like yeah. uh, yeah, in a really harsh way. So, but this guy, he was just—he was so out and out corrupt. Whereas she was a little more subtle in her uh, machinations. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it made sense that like she was able to keep outsmarting the students, and she used her power in a really intelligent way. Whereas this principal, you're just like how how like he's just like forcing his will on everybody. At that, at some point, you have to become. A little sneakier if you want to stay in a position like that you know even if you do have blackmail material and everybody <laughs> i'm on episode 13 right now like i said at the beginning and one of the things that uh, one of the things that really strikes me about the expired food thing is for some reason doing the wrong thing is easier than doing the right thing <laughs> like okay so they've they've been discovered with the expired food stuff you would think at that point you'd be like okay let's let's stop with the expired food instead of doing that they kind of the principle is all about blackmailing the students with good food and it's like isn't that more trouble and potentially yeah. more expense than just doing things by the book i, I find it really just, odd <laughs> and that was the one uh like i don't want to really go into too much detail because i don't no, I don't think you've reached the point where it's, like, resolved that plot thread, but that was the one where I was just not... It didn't make sense to me how they dealt with the story from the teacher's side or from even, like, X and the student's side and, like, how they resolved it didn't make sense to me. It didn't seem consistent with the rest of the show. But I don't want to, like, go into more detail just oh, in case. I feel bad that I don't you can't spoil go into anything. more detail. Shall I take off my headphones and then you can go into detail and tell me when I can come back? <laughs> Seriously, I'm fine with this. Sure, if you <laughs> okay. don't... Yeah, I'm taking off my headphones. Tell me, like, tell me in the IMX right. when I can come back. Okay. Yeah, I basically just thought that they, like Saya said, it was ridiculous how they were still trying to cover it up even when it was exposed. But then on the student side, I didn't understand why that threat against Sarang and her mom worked when they could have just easily reported it to the media. Like, why were they just using it as a threat? They should have just reported it to the media and the Board of Education in the first place. And got something done. I don't understand why they were trying to like continue to do things as X and just get themselves in more trouble, knowing that it, they're getting closer and closer to being discovered and, and possibly expelled. I just that, there was such an easy solution that they didn't use. That didn't make sense to me at all. I don't know how you felt about that, Pastor Uh I, I have two points on this. Uh, the first one is that I think we know by the end of the show uh, that. Uh, Taewoon doesn't want her dad. Didn't I'm sorry. Taewoon didn't want his dad to be exposed to the media, to the outside world. He didn't. He really didn't want his dad to suffer. And his dad was obviously hand in glove uh, about this expired food stuff. He wanted the school to resolve it himself. So you know maybe that's why X was doing stuff inside the school instead of just reaching out and you know getting help from education board and stuff. But the thing that really bothered me was. How was the chairman of the school, Taewon's dad, letting his own son eat expired food? That 
makes yeah. no sense to me. What, what Same once, here. Once the rich kids found out how like every small thing got them to tell to their parents who came uh, sort of in force to confront the principal and the chairman, but expired food was okay with their parents. It, yeah, that was what? ridiculous. Yeah, it was just the logic fails were too many in that one. I yeah, it, oh, I agree with your points. It was. I feel like they also used those story points because this drama only had enough story for 14 episodes and they needed to fill another you know hour and a half or whatever and that's probably why we got episode 15 the way we did too it's just dragged out you know yeah so no, yeah but should we tell Saya to come I back yeah let's nice. come back hi I wanted to say this when we were talking about teachers but then uh, we moved on but uh, basically so far in the entire drama there's just one thing I don't like um, and that's like Suji Sam, who is the police officer. And I knew you guys said like you don't understand why she's there, but I f actually find her not just uh, useless, but I find her dangerous as a character. Like she's always harping on about law and order, and I, like I don't know how accurate, how true it is to the Korean school system about having a police person on campus, but she like her entire mentality and mindset is so inappropriate and wrong for the context that like as a character she just makes me more angry than almost anyone else more angry than the principal uh you know more angry than um all of the various corrupt people uh, around because like she understands like uh the the role of well, perhaps she doesn't understand but like she's closer to the students like she understands their mindset she understands what they're thinking but that rather than that making her sympathetic it makes her really uh like she views them in a kind of a criminal context and that's not helpful like you can't look at kids like little criminals you can't treat yeah. everything they say as like witness testimony you can't go after them you know for transgressions that are apparently criminal activity and firstly because um the school is being unjust towards them. So until you solve that, you can't hold the students responsible for any transgressions they make in response to that. Uh, and it's just one of those things that makes me so furious every time she's on screen. And like I couldn't even remember her name half the time. I kept calling her Jenny because that was her character name in God's Gift 14 Days, which is the <laughs> last thing I saw her in. <laughs> I agree with all your points. And I think they could have done something really interesting by bringing her in that way and then kind of because like your point about how you can't treat kids like criminals like teacher shim says that but like mm -hmm. they never really get to the end resolution of that you know point where her like she never really understands his point about that she's just like at a certain point they just fall in love and then everything's okay but like she never oh, really, really comes to realize that that, that <laughs> there's an I mean, whatever, it was cute, but, like, I, I would have wanted her to actually, you know, come to the point of understanding why it's problematic to, you know, treat children like criminals and enforce the rules when the rules are being unjustly enforced, you know? Like, but there isn't really, like, they could have done something very interesting, but they didn't go there, and that was disappointing. Right, and, like, her, uh, um... The, I didn't see any conclusion to the romance, although, you know, I've seen the start of it. The, I really resented uh, Teacher Shim, you know, liking her, uh, you know, um, in a, a romantic way, because to me, she was the enemy within, and you can't fall for the enemy. <laughs> so that was just wrong, Teacher Shim. Why did you do that? But he just loves everyone. <laughs> He's just he the puppy does. that just loves everyone. It's true. It's sad. I really like it. I feel sad for him. <laughs> this this was sort of felt best. like he was falling in love with someone who could potentially abuse his affection. It just she, I, they, they were like diametrically opposite when it came to personal philosophies. Also, she so, plows over him all the time. Yeah, she does, and it's not not in a not in a way that can be negotiated in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, had a weird fun. dynamic. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I want to talk about the friends, like around uh, Ragino and uh, Kim Timun. Let's talk about their friends. Yes. Yay, let's talk about the friends. Faster, faster, go ahead. About, do you guys still want to talk about uh, Osaram? Uh, just the thing about uh, Osaram's character is that um, 
her wanting to be a civil servant because and her, her being very um, sure about her uh, goals that she wants to give her mother a comfortable life and she's very cheerful about it and she wants to become a civil servant she's going to get a job out of school and she won't enjoy college college life like all her friends want to and she is very positive about that entire thing until you know uh, her mom repeatedly tells her you know give that up go to a college enjoy that life don't live in a way that you know makes you responsible for me before you are even an adult that was a nice and poignant relationship but uh, again it didn't actually go anywhere i feel like they had a lot of really good ideas for like other storylines apart from the main one and they kind of couldn't carry them all the way to their conclusion which yeah. was unfortunate it, it, exactly they started off strong and then kind of petered off like without actually reaching a conclusion it it was really nice to see uh tevon surrounded uh, by friends because he was such a loner in the beginning and that, like uh rayno says towards the end it was just nice seeing him be an 18 year old boy with a group of friends and yeah. we see a lot of glimpses of that towards the end so if if that was the main arc of the of the story about uh tevon finally becoming a schoolboy instead of this sort of grim loner with his sad uh back story and this i don't know lonely painful heart <laughs> it was that that did it very well I I agree with both of you about uh how wonderful it was to see that friendship group develop and get bigger one person at a time as well cuz like you know first you yeah. start off with just Uno and then she makes friends with Tune and then you know that circle expands and and as it does that at the same time you see Sarang being left outside of that because she was almost the last person to be brought into the circle right so like i was watching that and like i was you know feeling a twinge for Sarang because you can understand her loneliness watching her friend you know her best friend moving further away from her and also watching her best friend make all of these other friends while she's still alone so like you know i felt a pang when i saw that and again i don't know how this concludes but i'm at this point where you know i think things are about to get really serious for sarang and i really like her she's so cute yeah she's like you it's a really relatable arc in their friendship because as you can tell they've just been like stuck together probably since grade school and this is the first time that they're really having a conflict or any kind of distance in their relationship and it's hard to watch and it's like we've been through that i you know, you know i know i've been through that with my own friends that was really well done I, I agree more because it's not even because it's not even conflict like if it's conflict there's you know there's this potential for resolution which is much more immediate but because it was just distance distance is harder to breach so it's kind of like the resolution here is almost yeah. harder because the further you become away from someone the harder it is to become close to them so uh, we are going Please. into how the uh, say how things were resolved between uh, sara and uh, you know i uh, really it, it it's it's a difficult position that you know is in because her uh, friendship with they were before the romance it was their friendship that really drew me in and they became friends in a really adorable way and you could see the affection between them and how strong it was and you could yeah. see her slowly drifting away from sarang if that entire thing was done so organically but you know you, you got a you got a feel for you know like she can't choose if if she is asked to choose between her oldest friend and this guy that she's so close to right now what does she do she can't exactly truncate one relationship so if you are in a position like that where you know your old you know your older a best friend is feeling sad because you're drifting away from her and yet you can't exactly change your feelings about your new friend or what you do that's that's a pretty difficult position to be in yeah i agree so like for me that line i think it's at the end of maybe episode 3 or 4 where i think uno says at 18 anyone can become your friend it really sums up the the way that the drama talks talks about friendship and about being that age because it's it's like you know these you have these two main characters who are so different from each other and they kind of you know don't get along and then like they slowly become friends and they start 
supporting each other in their dreams and trying to like make each other a better person and keeping each other's secrets and then they fall in love and it's just like this really beautiful blossoming of friendship and a relationship between people who basically had nothing in common in the beginning and it just goes to like talk about that possibility of like even the teacher he's like you, you know like you're only 18 your life is not over even though a lot of the bad adults in the school are telling them you know like this is just the way the world is you might as well learn now once you get out there it's just going to be just as corrupt so just accept it but the drama is kind of saying like no you're only 18 you still have your whole life you can still change your life you can still be the person that you want to be you can change who you want to be and i really found that inspiring and i loved how it played out through the friendships between really different people coming together to form this like friend group that was amazing by the end so I completely agree with that. And also, it reminds me, isn't this what's so appealing about school dramas? Because the the whole thing with school is that you're in a, an environment where you can't choose anything. You can't choose who, who you're with. You can't choose who your teachers are. You can't choose who you're sitting next to. Like you say, it's an, a completely disparate group of people who only have an age group in common being lumped together and sort of being expected to, to make something of it. And it's like this, this wonderful alchemy of, of school stories always, and also perhaps in real life as well. Because the friends you make in school, often, you know, you grow up and you realize they're not people you'd ever have made friends with otherwise. Like my best friend, uh, she is my old school friend. But if we were to meet now, we have nothing in common, not one single thing, except that we spent seven years in the same sort of pressure cooker. Like, you know, because that's so relatable in every school story ever, it's another thing that just I really enjoy. I love high school stories done right. Yeah. One more person I wanted to mention. Uno's oppa. <laughs> He's so funny. <laughs> just wanted to give Can him we a little shout just out. Just talk about Uno's family because I love her family so <laughs> her much. Her family is so great. Especially her mom. <laughs> I, yeah, they're, they're the best. <laughs> but her brother just yeah, takes that, it to the that, next that level. Was a, really sweet supportive family yeah and but, i love how her mom is like always scolding her for her, the bad things she's doing but then like as soon as she shows up at school she's like ready to you know take to the war. principal down and yeah like go to war and she's like there's that one scene where like they're facing off against the rich girl's mom or the no he chan's mom maybe and yeah. he chan's mom is like do you know who my husband is and she's like do you know who my husband is and she like says his name i think they would know him it was the best i love that and because she's sitting in her kitchen right then in like in una's house sitting at her table and it's like how rude are you you nasty rich woman you think your money is enough to go and sit in someone else's house with their family around them and threaten them just like that it was so great how every last one of them came and backed her up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was really that was, nice. yeah, it was really nice to see because it's, yeah, and it's so often that the rich parents are able to you know cow the poor parents into submission, but it was really nice that her parents were always on her side no matter what. And like you could see where Uno got her spirit from as well because she uh, this was again Hichun was trying to intimidate her into giving up, and she's like I'm not gonna give up. What makes you think that I'm going to give up? Like, you think because you've got money and you've got backing that this entitles you. It doesn't entitle you. All you have is money. You don't have right. And I really enjoyed and I that liked contrast. That, and I like that theme, like, speaking about families, also with Sarang's mom, where, like, a parent's... Because there's this thing of, like, if you don't have money for your kids, then you don't have anything. But that's not true. Like, your parents' job is not just to provide you with money, it's to be a parent, you know? And, like, I really liked that scene with Sarang and her mom where her mom's like, I'm your mom. Like, just trust me and I'll take care of you. You don't have to take that on yourself. And so you get that narrative of, like, Uno's parents as well where they're like, we're your parents. Like, we're here for you. Like, and that it shows that part of the equation is so important. It's not just the financial support that you need. And that's what makes her such a strong, like you said, such an amazing person, even though she's, like, you know, at the bottom of the last place in the academic ranking she doesn't really have any money <laughs> she's not smart but she has her parents behind her you can see it go ahead uh, this, your this this uh, there was this wonderful moment when uh, all these students were like uh uh Rehi, Namju, uh they were 
walking back and you remember her uh, you know her dad was paving the uh, uh, the footpath uh, he was doing something like some construction work and uh, yeah. she saw him being scolded by his supervisor and she ran up to him and with it just her complete lack of embarrassment like really shame dwehi and namju you could see it on their face the fact that they yeah. were embarrassed in the situation but she was not mm-hmm. and it, it is one of the many moments where you see how strong uh, ragno is and how her uh, sense of self is really grounded like she knows who she is and she's not ashamed to own up to it yeah and, and the other thing about uh, ragno is that uh, how often did people say that she's not smart enough or that she's dumb like including her teachers and other students and Like I know Theo was calling her dimwit, like out of affection, and not because he really thinks she's unsmart. But I just got a little tired of that because it's repeatedly shown that Ram, you know, is actually a really smart girl. Yeah, that so, bothered me a little bit too. But then you would have to value creative intelligence to know that she wasn't good at maths and like whatever it is that people do to prove. That they're smart with numbers. Yeah, neither was Dayun. He he was getting really low ranks too. Nobody was calling him dumb. But he had money, so it was okay. <laughs> no, but that doesn't stop people from calling people dumb. I just look. It's, it's a I I do like, it's, I do also think that it is potentially a culture thing, um, because like in certainly in um my community, people don't uh. They don't put a lot of thought into like they don't care that much if they've said insulting things to people. They don't worry about, you know, hurting someone's feelings or being belittling. They'll just say whatever comes to mind. And things like calling people idiots and stuff, that's just a, you know, it comes very easily to a certain group that that I've noticed while um perhaps in sort of normal uh, do, do I say British culture or just sort of I don't know. In other contexts, yeah. I've um you know there is a lot of concern about not saying these kinds of demeaning words to kids, but I don't think it's it's true across every culture. I don't think it's cultural though because uh, one of the reasons the uh, Hichan told the principal that uh, you know can't be X is because she's not smart enough. and that was repeatedly brought up right you know it's not smart and now she's too dumb for this and it just look she um yeah no it's it, it's a it's a thing it's and i've repeatedly seen uh this done in um uh, asian dramas and um is that the girl especially a young girl being called dumb it and it's a totally acceptable thing yeah yeah so, i agree that i agree that like it it could be partly cultural just the bluntness but i also agree that that it, there is an element of sexism because like you said this trope of the dumb girl and the smart guy is like way too overplayed like there is no balance whatsoever it's always the girl's really dumb but she has a heart of gold she works really hard everybody walks all over her but she's still you know like she's you know very very energetic and cheerful she doesn't want to get her down and then like the the guy can be you know the guy is always a genius even evil though he's or, bad at school <laughs> yeah but even if he doesn't try yeah even if he's failing you know that once he tries he's always going to be really smart Because and he always knows the genius. right thing to do and he always tells the girl what the right thing to do is and like i like that they kind of he wasn't always right about everything in between Taeun and Eunho like a lot of times she was right but there was that still that narrative of like you're dumb you're dumb you're dumb and it was too much and i really didn't like the fact that he called her dumb especially in the beginning this, like he... this is again why school 2013 was so amazing because now so then you so remained idiots like they they were not ranking low because they were some hidden geniuses they were just <laughs> that's true not that good in school and that... park se young's character she was really smart and she remained smart to the end that's a good point you're making me want to go back and rewatch 2013 honestly <laughs> but the problem it with 2013 so- the problem <laughs> with 2013 was that it was an all boys dr- uh, drama um it had like you know its token a uh, character uh, female characters in like Park yeah, Seung and a couple of other true. people that's but it true. wasn't like i loved yeah, it but it it was a boy drama and i actually i really loved boy drama it was so funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I did I did appreciate that the focus was on a heroine this time. That's for sure. That was really nice. Yeah. 
do we do we mention uh, excess antiques at all? The fact that most of them were kind of ineffectual. <laughs> I'm not sure how he uh, was held to be such a huge hero, but uh, no, we don't talk about it. I think we um, didn't talk about it, right? <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't really go into it that much, but we talked about it in more general terms in the sense that, like, we talked about what was the strength of the drama, and that wasn't really included in there, so I guess, you Which know. Which probably essentially just means X wasn't the strength. <laughs> no, and, like, X was more, like, the A gimmick. thing that brought them all together and made them interact with each other rather than being the main goal of the story. So it was way- a catalyst for yeah, X together. was like a device rather than uh, X wasn't really a character. Yeah. No, X was a, a mask that they won't wore, as he said, uh, mm-hmm. was the end, which we are not going to discuss. I, I really, I did really like that moment where you know um, when uh, what's a turn is about to break into the cafeteria, well not break and let himself into the cafeteria, and then one by one each of his friends turn up with the X hoodie. <laughs> that was a pretty cool moment. Yeah, <laughs> I liked how they all kind of took on the mantle by the end. And I also want to know where they buy their hoodie. <laughs> yes, apparently they all have one in their closet. <laughs> like, what I feel about this uh, show, um, School 2017, is that it uh, it tried to replicate a lot of the best aspects of School 2013. And I think it also tried to get, like... Uh, answer the failure of 2015's romance and I think it achieved more or less it achieved both things like it replicated the good stuff of 2013 not to the same degree but to some degree and it uh it achieved like what it didn't achieve with the bromance it uh, achieved like to an explosive scale with the romance it was pretty explosive. I have to agree with that. <laughs> and oh my god, yeah. the moon was so smooth. The guy <laughs> with his first crush is not this smooth. I was going to oh, say, what? he was way too smooth for an 18-year-old. He did not have the arms of an 18-year-old either, but let's just leave that there. But he was way too confident and smooth. Oh my god. But I kind of felt that that was part of his package. Like, he had all the lines, but he also, he, inside he was flailing. And, you know, everything no, that you loved, imagine a girl he doing, he was on the flailing. inside. He loved the flailing, but the no, thing I mean, is that it comes out. Like, when you're faced with the girl or the guy that you have such a huge crush on, and you're confessing your feet, you are just not that, you you stumble, okay? You get nervous, you, you like... You you sweat. It it becomes very awkward. No, but I, I feel like he has a natural. He has this natural. Like his character has a natural. Uh, what is it? Uh, um, uh, ability to perform. He he is a performer. Like I mean, he's hiding the fact that he's X. He's pretending mm. that he is. You know a completely different person to who he really is. He's all sorts of things. I get what you're saying, but also I think it plays to his character really well. Yeah, I mean, Saya, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm like, he's a perfect Kedra, my hero, but he's completely unbelievable. As oh, yeah, like absolutely, but that's the, joy. that's the joy of the dramas, is that you get to see yeah. these completely fantastic, line-perfect romances that are just imperfect enough for it to actually be somewhat believable and to make you buy it yeah. wholeheartedly and not feel like you're just, you know, being fed lines. Like it feels true. all real, and that's what's so like wonderful about it. Yeah, this is true. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like weightlifting fairy. Like, where would you ever find a guy like that? But it was perfect. <laughs> you know, so. I can answer that. Nowhere. He doesn't exist. Isn't that a really good place to end? Okay then, that's a wrap. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Subscribe to Stars in My Pocket and follow us on Twitter at a K Drama Podcast. And if you've got a minute, leave us a review on iTunes. Bye. 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 <laughs>